going the extra mile. Look at somebody say, I'm, I'm going the extra mile. The Bible says if a man asks you to go one mile, go twain, or go two. It means go above and beyond what they ask you to do. And as we look at this passage in Luke, the 10th chapter, we'll go through it very, very quickly because I believe God wants to just speak to us. And I want you to look at any time that we have uh, a word in this house, uh, I want you to pull out the stuff that belongs to you and then pass the rest of it on. But make sure that you filter it all and don't just pass on something you're supposed to chew on. Just because you're running from something doesn't mean it's not for you. Amen? Amen. So starting at the 25th verse, the 25th verse, it says, And behold, behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering, answering said, That thou shalt love the Lord thy God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And we can stop right there and preach this, and I'm just going to touch on this just for a moment. So we understand that all the Ten Commandments is hinged on this very passage, and all the law is summed up in this very passage, is love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy, all thy mind, all thy strength, and love thy neighbor as thyself, Right? So this is what the lawyer, he was looking to accuse Jesus, but he asked him, uh, Jesus says, what, what does it say in the book? He says, well, I'm, I'm just supposed to love God with all my heart and to love my neighbor as myself. I'm sure all of us can look at that and say, well, you know, we do that. I love God. Amen? How many can say that? I love God. I come to church. Come on, I'm, I, I come to church on Sunday morning. I come to church on Sunday night. I come to church on Wednesday night. Come on, I mow the lawn. I, I clean up the trash. I, come on. I, I'm preaching to the choir in this place. Amen. I'm preaching to the choir. But just simply coming to church doesn't mean all that. Amen. It doesn't mean all that. I'm glad that you're here. Amen. I'm glad that you're in the house. But Jesus was just trying to get him to do some soul searching. Because when we talk about our neighbor, uh, look at someone and say he's talking about you. It's easy to love the, the, the yous in this place. It's easy to love folks in this place. Amen? I remember pastoring my first church. No, no downgrade anything about the first church because in the first church, I was, a, I was very wet behind the ears. I was just a young man, and I thought I, had knew, uh, I, I, thought I knew a couple things, but that's what I thought I knew, just a couple things. And as I started pastoring, as we started pastoring, we thought that everybody was like the last church that we come from. Amen. Uh, I mean, that's what I'm talking about. We, we came from a, a church that we was raised up in. My father-in-law was the pastor there, and everybody loved one another. Amen. Everybody was, we was just all young converts, and we just grew. We had fun together. Amen. We just grew together. I mean, it's a powerful church. We did not know what we was doing. We didn't have uh, growth 101 or nothing like that, 102, 103. We didn't have any of that. All we had was love for people, and it was beautiful. We would have uh, fellowships over the house. Matter of fact, sometimes we'd dance. Amen. We'd, we'd dance. And I know it wasn't spiritual, but boy, we had fun. Amen. And we grew together. We prayed together. We ate people's cooking. And all of it wasn't good. All of, all of the cooking wasn't good. Sometimes you would tolerate somebody's cooking. I, I, I love it when somebody comes up and says, Now, I can cook. You got to try this. And you put it in your mouth, you're going to throw up. Amen. But. But you just say, hmm, won't eat that again. They may won't eat that again. But we, we had a lot of fun times. And we'd laugh about them people who thought they could, they couldn't, amen. But we had some good times. And we grew. I'm telling the church just multiplied because we loved one another. And that was a beautiful thing. And that's how this church started. So that, that was, that was that, that the kind of mindset we had. So when I went to the first church, I went with that culture I, I, I come from a different culture than they was used to being raised in. So here I was a young preacher. Come on, listen, I, I didn't care about I didn't care about this, that, and the other kind of no, the church politics. I wasn't into that. I didn't know anything about that. All I was a, like a, a young country uh, country boy went in to preach the gospel, and boy, we did, I just let them have it. It was all good, amen. As long as uh, the family was one coming in, but when the outsiders started coming in, it wasn't good. Amen. I don't know something I'm talking about. Amen. I tell you, we had church. We had church. Come on. 
Aunt Sally and, and, and Cousin Bob and all of them come together in one, one group. And I'm telling you, we was having church. They said, oh, you're the best pastor. Oh, you're the best. Oh, I'll tell you what, I've been so proud. I'm telling you, thank you for, you know, my, my cousin got saved. My brother got, my husband got saved. And I, we had church. I mean, we, we doubled in size right away. It wasn't nothing. We doubled in size. And, and uh, the, the, the folks was getting saved. Family was getting saved. But when them old, uh, when them old rough boys and rough girls started coming, you know, the ones that was dancing on the table the night before, in the bars, they start coming in and giving their heart to Jesus. Well, then you know what? That was kind of uncomfortable for them. Amen. I'm not putting them down by no means because it was a different culture. And I was used to seeing uh, souls saved, lives saved, people loved regardless of what they was, you know, what kind of situation they was in. So uh, it was fun. It was it was revival to us. My wife and I, we was having revival. Amen. Had a young convert class and we was growing. That young convert class got so big we had to uh, multiply and have two young convert class. That was a beautiful thing because now we're growing. I'm telling you, we're discipling, and those disciples are discipling others. Most of those ones in those disciple class became pastors and preachers. I'm telling you, they was they just grew, and the church multiplied. And just a just a few months, a couple of years, that was over. It was like, hey, I know we're about 200. But uh, but we don't want this kind of growth. We don't, and, and I'm going to tell you this: it hurt for a little bit because now my culture is messed up. Now my culture was good, I thought, and and I, I still believe it was. But they was uncomfortable because of change. And if I had more wisdom as a young pastor, I could have led them in that growth instead of just shoving growth down their throat. And I, I think you know, uh, I believe all of us can learn some things. So I'm not just putting it down on that church, I believe that I could have used a lot more wisdom. But guess what? I didn't have wisdom back then in that area because I never had to experience. But after that, I gained a little more wisdom than I had. How many had to gain wisdom by something you had to be through or had to go through? Amen. So, uh, so when we look at this passage in the beginning of it, we see that there was a culture or, or uh, not, not a culture, but the Lord just simply said, I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. That's all right as long as it's family. It's all right as long as it's people that you that you hang with. Amen. It's all right, right? It's all right as long as it's your friends, your crowd, the, the people that you click with. Uh, maybe that's not a good word, but maybe you jail. How about looking at somebody and saying, "I'm he's talking about jail now." I'm, I'm, I understand him. The, the people that you, that that you become your family, the one that you your besties. I believe it's all good when they start coming around, but then when you reach outside that box and people come in that you don't know, amen? Uh, we, we, have a, we have a camp that, um, we, we camp at a, a place on Wapapella and, and it's uh, kind of our haven away from everything and we, we love that. I, uh, my wife's a camper. I, I'm going to tell you this. Uh, I, I didn't really much care for camping. I've had bad experience when I've when I've, I've grown up, but I've, I'm changing my culture. I'm got I'm getting to like it, amen. I'm getting to to chill out because now we have some little more comfort. I like to sleep not on rocks. I like to sleep on a mattress. I mean, those we're talking about, amen. You guys that like to sleep in a tent, God bless you, amen. I mean, go for it. Stay with it, amen. Get your tent at your house. Sleep out in your yard. I don't care, amen. But for me, I like to sleep on a on a bed. Amen. I like to sleep on a bed. I like to have a, a nice warm shower, a hot shower in the morning. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. That's my kind of camping. Amen. Don't call me. Don't call me a sissy boy. I just like my showers. I like my camping or like my bed. But now we have some people that's showing up on the campground. We have some people showing up on the campground. We have our group, you know, the older generation. Not that I'm one of them. Amen. But I'm getting there pretty rapid. Amen. So we, we have some people that we jail with, but now there's some outsiders coming in. Mm. They drink out of blue cans and red cans. And you know what I'm talking about? Come on, they move right in next to the preacher. That's me. Amen. They move right up next to me. And I'm going to tell you this. Uh, the, the, the other campground 
people, they said, mm, this is not good. They're moving by the preacher. Oh, man, I, I'm all oh, preacher. I hope you don't get offended. I said, I'm getting excited is what I'm getting. Hey, Amen. I'm getting excited because now, now we, we've got something to do. I'm done. Because we're going to reach outside our boundaries and not be just gathered up in our little section. Amen. And just having a good time. But now we're, we're going to share Jesus to them. I'm excited. Amen. I'm excited about their, their camper rocking, playing, you know, playing old country songs and this and the other and drinking some beer and, and partying wild because I'm going to go out and say, hey, hey man, how y'all doing? <laughs> Amen. So Jesus asked him and he said this. He said, all right, you said, but now who's your neighbor? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Now he said, he said this. And answered in the 27th verse, and he said, Answer said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, all thy strength, and all thy mind, and love your neighbor as thyself. And he said unto them, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he willingly to justify himself said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Now I've got neighbors in my my, my hood, all right, in my neighborhood, I guess we can call that. I got neighbors in, around me in my little section at, at Woodland Drive that I don't know. I do. I, I, I get so busy. Come on, listen to me. I, I believe sometimes if they had hidden cameras, they would laugh. Uh, at, at me because I'll come in maybe in some work clothes and in about three or four minutes just enough to, to change clothes get a shower boom I'm back out in a suit or I'm back out in dress clothes and I'm back in maybe I come back two or three times and I change my attire and go back out so sometimes my house is very busy but there's people around my neighborhood that I don't know now it says love my neighbors but I believe it's going a little bit past that because the man said who is Thy neighbor. And Jesus just goes on here in a few moments to talk about who the neighbor is. Come on, look at somebody and say, Are you my neighbor? Punch them in the ribs. Amen. Pull their hair and say, Are you my neighbor? <laughs> the third verse it says, And Jesus answered, said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem. This is a parable. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the thieves and stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So a man left Jerusalem. He was a, a Jewish man and he was, he was a man that was uh, considered to be an heir, one of the brothers, a man, or one of the family. And the Bible says that he was stripped of his raiment. I know Jewish people, they wore different raiment than just a Samaritan or, you know, something on the outside. They had, they was identified differently, but they were stripped of their identity. Many times in life, people get stripped of their identity because things that happen to them, things come on and strip them of his raiment. The Bible says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, amen, or comes to strip us or people. And Jesus just simply goes on to talk about this man that was left half dead. He says, stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that that way, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. All right, let me give you just a little description. So when the when, when the, the man that was wounded was laying in the ditch naked, a man stripped of his garment, thieves took everything he had, the priest went back and said, hmm, man, don't want to bother with that. See, there's something about getting involved in people's situation that's messy. That's costing you something. Because we live in a society don't want to be put out. We've scheduled ourselves so tight that if we veer off our schedule, it messes our whole thing up. Our, 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 our whole direction, I guess, 
Because now we're having to stop what we're doing and reorganize or reschedule our life because of somebody else's situation. See, loving people sometimes is messy. Loving people sometimes is not fun. Loving your neighbor is not always easy. Come on, I've got a neighbor that lives by me that sometimes he's not always easy. Amen? You don't know him then. Your neighbors are not always easy to love. I'm not talking about your physical neighbors just, but sometimes people around you is not easy to love, especially if it's inconvenient. I'm moving right along, but I promise you I'm going to park here for just a few moments. And by chance there came the 31st verse, and by chance there came a certain priest, by the way, and he saw him and passed on the other side, 32. And likewise a Levite, a spiritual man, when he was at the at the place, came and looked on him and passed by him on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Let's back up in this passage, grab that 33, mark it, mark it, uh, and highlight it. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. Now look, there's, there's, there's one thing to look upon somebody, but there's another thing to come where he is or where they are. Right. See, if I can put myself in their shoes or put myself in where they're at or, 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 or maybe walk the last mile with them. See, never talk to somebody and think that you're going to help them unless you know where they've been. And how about this? Let them, tell your, let them tell their story to you and walk the last mile with them with compassion, with feeling. Go there. And then you'll understand why they went there. Now this man didn't have anything of his own fault. Life just happened. Because sometimes life just happens. I went to uh, New York City. You know where they make picante sauce. <laughs> I went to New York City and I was with my brother and my nephew as we went there. My brother said, let's just stay up all night. We was on a business trip and our flight was at like 5 o'clock in the morning. We were supposed to be at the airport. And he said, you know what? Why don't we just stay up all night and see if New York City sleeps? I said, okay. Now, we wasn't out running the bars, but we went out to see what the city did. I seen people in that city when it was 10 o'clock, they was professionals. They was professional artists, and they was on the sidewalk, and they would draw your picture. But I seen a different crowd come out at 12 o'clock. I seen the ones that come out in the gutter. They was homeless. That would take the tablets of the artists that the artists threw away that only had two or three pages left in it, but they would leave it on the sidewalk, and now a homeless man would grab that pad that was left and he would grab their broken pencils and he would stand before you and he said, can I draw you? And my brother, my nephew, and myself let them draw us. And I find to look at the ones that was in the gutter or ones that was homeless was actually a better artist than the ones that was professionals that was doing it in the daylight. And when you hear their story, some are lawyers, some are doctors, some was businessmen, some was artists that wanted to make it, but couldn't make it. There's people from all walks of life that no one gave them a hand up because they never went to where there was. 
and understood or had compassion on their story and gave them a way out. There's people all around this city, come on, Dexter, Bloomfield, that are out there that's got talent, that's got giftings, that are looking for somebody to reach down and pick them up and to go where they're at. Hear me now, church, if you'll listen to me for a moment. I believe that that's where God is bringing the church to understand that there's a neighbor that's just right on the sound of our voice or that we pass by. Sometimes because we're driven so hard in this life, it's okay to be driven, but don't be so driven that we drive past our purpose. I believe that right here on the sound of my voice and in this city, in Bernie, Kenneth, Bloomfield, Essex, I believe that there are people that have simply gave up on their dreams, gave up on living, and they're hiding themselves in a bottle, or they're hiding themselves in a chemical, they're hiding themselves in a relationship. Are you here in this house? They're hiding themselves in a job. Maybe professional people that are simply successful, but they're hiding themselves in work. Their addiction is work. And they're afraid to love. They're afraid to give. They're afraid to reach out. There's preachers that have felt like they have failed, and they refuse to get back up because of shame. Their mountain is so great that they don't understand there's a ladder that they can get on to climb to the top of that mountain. And that ladder is Jesus. Amen. When the angels us him and we sin. There's a helper. Today I tell you that there's hope. And the only hope for mankind and womankind. I'm going to say that. Mankind and women. All of us. The only hope that we have is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the love of God is shed abroad in our heart that we can share it to mankind. And I believe that God is raising up people that will love. You don't have to have had a, 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 an addiction to love past where you're at. Right. You don't have to ever go down to the gutter to have love for the people that is in the gutter. All you have to have is the love of Christ on the inside of you. But a certain Samaritan in 33rd, 33rd verse, as a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came to where he was. Look at somebody and say, he said, he came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Look at somebody right now. I know this is uncomfortable, but look at him. Go ahead and look at him right now. Because the eye is the doorway of the heart. If you really want to find out what's going on with somebody, don't freak them out. Come on, don't freak people out. Look at them in the eye and talk to them. And then, then when you look at them in the eye, you really know where they're at. Because the eye is the doorway of the soul. If I love them enough, I'll look at them in the eye and I'll go past them. I'll go and walk the last mile with them. And find out why they did what they did. This guy didn't do anything. Sometimes people are at no fault, but yet still in a mess. Sometimes because of the one that they yoked with. Don't yoke a donkey with an oxen because an oxen is a servant, and a donkey doesn't come to uh, he, he doesn't come to submission. So he's he's constantly bucking. And if you yoke them together, it'll rub the oxen, which is a servant. It'll rub them raw, and you wind up not getting anything out of the oxen. Sometimes people enter in a mess because they yoke with the wrong person. Yes, <laughs> you better watch who you're hanging with, who you're yoking with. Thirty-four and went to him had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds. He got messy. He got involved. Poured oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to the inn and took care of him. It cost him something. It was in an inconvenience. Messing with people and in their life is an inconvenience. Loving people Getting in their world is going to 
cost you something. But the love of God inside of you is going to want to pay that price because you're going to get way more out of it than you put into it. You're going to be connected to your purpose and you're going to feel God slip you on like a glove. And you're going to find out that God is really real and he has a plan for your life. I've watched people get up out of the hospital, come on, and, and, and live. I watched one guy as they pulled the tube out of his mouth. Come on. It was an inconvenience for me to be there, but I was glad to be there. But I, I watched this guy. They said, they said, uh, Pastor Russell, he's going to live about two minutes. I said, all right. I tried to leave him to the Lord. He was conscious. I tried to leave him to the Lord. Couldn't get anywhere with him because he couldn't articulate the words. So the moment, every time I asked him, I said, just say it in your mind. He said, he said, I said, say it in your mind. Just say these words in your mind. And I said, did you feel like he forgave you? I said, all right. All the family said goodbye. They said, I'm going to miss you, daddy. I'm going to miss you. I love you, buddy. He cried with them. Nurse came in and says, well, big steak too bad. I said, I'm staying in here. They said, what? I'm, I'm, I'm standing in for it all. I said, the moment you pull that tube out, I'm going to talk to him. So the moment they pulled that tube out of me, I said, Daddy, repeat these words at me. Father, Lord, forgive me, sir. Father, Lord, forgive me, my sir. Lord, I ask you to come in my heart. Lord, I ask you to come in my heart. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe you died for my sins. I receive you now. I receive you now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I said, Danny, do you feel like you forgave me? I sure do. Amen. Guess what? He went home the next morning from the hospital. Lord. Walked around town for a few months. God gave him time to get all his affairs in order and give, and give the love of God to his family. It was beautiful. It was an inconvenience for maybe some, but it was a blessing to me. He's in heaven today because it was an inconvenience, but we paid the price. I watched another woman that was, her eyes was fixed. You heard the story, her eyes was fixed. The whites of her eyes was already red. The, 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 uh, the iris of her eyes was actually protruded out, but the whites was ached. I mean, it was, it was just kind of deteriorated because her eyes had been open for like three or four days without blinking, maybe longer. This was the night. They called me in. I had Brother Gail Jordan with me, my son-in-law, and I, I, I told him, Hey, they told me the situation. This woman was not a Christian. And I said, well, listen to me. I said, the only way I know to pray, this is not a Christian. I said, the only way I know to pray is the prayer of faith. I made the family mad. Come on, the guys was, was a Christian. I made them mad. I said, I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but this is the only way I know to pray. In the name of Jesus, I prophesy this body. I prophesy these organs to live in the name of Jesus. Guess what? She went home. She went home like the next day. She was in church with us the week after. Amen. She had oxygen on her. Two weeks later, she come back to church. She had no oxygen on. And three weeks later, she was out playing bingo. Amen. And popped her blood. But she gave her heart to Jesus. Amen. I wouldn't want to say all that. But you understand this. That sometimes you've got to be inconvenienced. You've got to understand that God wants us to go the extra mile. Because he has a plan and a purpose for our lives. He said he put him on his own beast and took care of him. And, and on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him. Whatsoever thou spendest more, I will come again and I will repay thee. Which now, and Jesus says, Which now of these three thinketh thou was a neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. 
So the man coming to a bad situation, he didn't ask for it, he just left his town and all of a sudden he fell on, well, fell on thieves and he was left half dead. Many's like that. But now, the good Samaritan came. He went to where he was at. So we need to find out and go where they're at. He picked him up and he put him upon his own beast. He, he was inconvenienced because he was riding that beast, but now he put some else and carried it. He was inconvenienced, but the inconvenience became his ministry. And he took him to the end. He dressed his wounds. He got his hands involved. He dressed his wounds. He brought healing to him. And then he said this, he said, I'm not leaving you like this. Come on, there's been too many people that's been dropped, too many people that's been left. Come on, we love them. And, and then we don't, don't see any more. God will connect you to people that you can bring them up and mature them. Go on the extra mile. 